Well, good morning, Faith St. Thomas family. Thanks so much for joining us online this morning for worship. We're delighted that you've taken time to be with us, to worship with us, and to learn from God's word with us, and to be together, connected online with your church family. We hope you have an amazing experience as we begin our new Bible teaching series, as you hear some old songs and some new songs, and as we worship together. May God bless you and your family today, your small group as you meet together. May this be a really special experience as we begin this new part of the journey together.
Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our new Bible teaching series on the Gospel of Luke. The series is called Asking, Seeking, and Knocking. We're going to be taking up Jesus' invitation to follow him and to learn his ways, to learn his word, to learn his heart. Now, we're going to begin today right at the start of the book. So if you want to grab your Bible, the Gospel of Luke, one of the things I would encourage you to do, if you have a few extra dollars, is to go online and order yourself a copy of the Gospel of Luke as a devotional or as a journal. And this, if you're like me, will help you to focus, focus in your devotional life, focus in your study life. When I now reach for my Bible, I'm just reaching for the Gospel of Luke, and it's, it's getting all my time and all my attention. Let me read to us from Luke chapter 1, right at the beginning of Luke's story. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. When I was 17 years of age, almost 18, I became a Christian. I can still remember it, even though it's getting further and further away into my past. It was such a powerful moment in my story. My life began to change dramatically and quickly. And I put a lot of that down to a little book that I carried around in my pocket. It was a Gideon's New Testament. When I was 12 years old, the same as all 12-year-olds in the school system in Northern Ireland in the UK, some senior gentlemen from the business community would come to our school and visit and tell us about Jesus and give us all a little New Testament, a little red New Testament And we tucked them away inside our school blazers and nobody read them. But I carried mine around all the time, almost like it would bring me some sort of good luck or it might protect me in like one of those war movies where a bullet hits someone in the chest, but they survive because they have a little book in their pocket. And so I always carried this little Gideon's New Testament around with me. When I became a Christian, that was the first place that I went to to learn how to follow Jesus. And so I started right at the very beginning, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I was reading and reading and reading the Gospels all the time. And I started to notice that I was being changed and transformed. I was learning new ways to think. But more importantly than that, I was discovering Jesus. And I was falling in love with Jesus. This was, you need to remember, a new thing for me. I hadn't grown up in church, I hadn't grown up with religious parents, and I hadn't grown up with the Bible. So for the first time in my life, I was discovering the Son of God. I was discovering Jesus Christ. Before that, the only thoughts that I've ever had about salvation or rescue were from watching the A-Team on Saturday afternoon, or David Hasselhoff and all the beautiful lifeguards in Baywatch. Now for the first time, I was learning about God's salvation and more importantly, God's Savior, Jesus Christ. But then something happened along the way as part of my journey. I started to go to church. And when you go to church as a new Christian, churches get very excited. You're kind of like a little trophy. And so you would get invited into lots of people's homes and you would get invited to lots of people's Bible studies so that they could show the little trophy off to everyone else. And so I started going to Bible studies with lots of other young Christians and not so young Christians and all of them with a good heart. Like I was this new believer and I needed to learn what it was to be a Christian. But I discovered very quickly that in these Bible studies, while we would read the Bible and we would talk about Peter and Paul, we would very quickly move to talking about issues and politics and then difficult theological ideas and complex verses and whether women can speak or not or whether people should cover their heads and worship or not. And we would have all these conversations and I began to realize that we talked about everything apart from Jesus. 
But of course, I didn't know any better. These were mature Christians, people that had been following Jesus and going to church for a long time. And so for me, I thought, well, this is what you do. And very quickly, the fire in my heart that burned really brightly for the Son of God started to go a little dim. I was kind of like a campfire after the s'mores. You know, it was just the embers that were left. There was a glow inside of me, but the, that bright burning fire was going, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. A number of years later, I was working as a youth pastor and had the opportunity to take some young leaders to a leadership conference at Willow Creek in Chicago in, in the U.S., and there I had the privilege of sitting under the ministry of a man named Ray Vanderland. Now, if you're a fan or you use Right Now Media, you probably know Ray Vanderland. He's an expert in the area of first century Christianity, of uh, early church, of first century Judaism, of the rabbinical ways. Like He's just a real master in the whole conversation of discipleship. And there in Chicago, I heard a sermon that would changed my life. I wonder if, you've, if you know that sermon for you, the one that left you undone, that like took you down. You know, when I think about this sermon, I think about a really bad rugby injury that I once had. I'd been in a car accident and had damaged my back without realizing that I'd done that. And I turned out for my rugby team a couple of days later and without knowing that that little damage to my back had caused me some issues with my hamstring. And off I went and I was running, playing rugby. And all of a sudden, it was as if a sniper had taken me down. I wasn't near the ball. I wasn't near a player to tackle me. I was just running along. And the next thing, boom, I hit the ground. My hamstring had severed in two. I was completely undone. Some of us can relate to that from a preaching perspective. We can remember a sermon that took us out and took us down and left us undone. And for me, it was Ray Vanderland's sermon in Chicago back in 2003. Ray got onto the stage, and after the round of applause from the thousands of people who were gathered, Ray said something that turned on the lights for me. His opening comment to the, to the sermon was this. I know a lot of Christians, but I only know a handful of disciples. I was undone. He said, I know a lot of Christians, but I only know a handful of disciples. We exist, you and I, in a culture that has created a theological reality where you can be a Christian without any expectation of following Jesus Christ. I love my job as a pastor, and I love being a pastor here at Faith St. Thomas this week. We celebrated five years of ministry. I don't love all the parts of my job, and my kids will be able to tell you stories about that when they listen to me grumble and complain. Perhaps one of the hardest things is having hundreds and hundreds of bosses. You know, that's the unique thing about being a pastor, is that everybody in your church knows how to do your job better than you. It's a struggle for all pastors, but you know what? We just get used to it. That's the reality. And you know, one of the ways that I kind of humor myself in the middle of that is I imagine myself going to work with you. You know what it would be like for me as a pastor to go to your work and to tell you how to be a better teacher and a better police officer and a better public servant and a better accountant and how to do a more honest job with your taxes and all of those things, right? But of course, I, I don't get to do that, but that allows me to humor myself through the reality of, you know, having all of these bosses in my life. One of the things that's really misunderstood in everyone's opinions about what it is to be a pastor. You know, some people think pastor's job is to teach, you know, and that's what I need to do. I need to teach people good theology and sound doctrine and, you know, help people with their pastoral care expectations. Aside from all of that, one of the things that's, that's really missed in the whole world of being a pastor is a church understanding a pastor's heart. And that's something that I've really given myself to over these last number of years as I've journeyed with other pastors, even our own staff, trying to learn the pastor's heart. And what is the pastor's heart? 
I think that every pastor in their heart has this one dream, and that's that the people in their congregation fall madly in love with Jesus. Good theology is important. Good discipleship is important. It's important to take care of one another and to create cultures of care in our community. But I think all of us pastors know that the answer to all of that is a people who are just ridiculously in love, head over heels in love with the Savior. And that's our heart. But here's the reality, and this is kind of where I want us to go to in, in the Gospel of Luke. It's hard to love Jesus if you don't know Jesus. It's hard to know him if you're not intentionally in the Gospels and intentionally in his word, learning about his word and his ways. We've created a culture as a church that we're so familiar with our doctrine and we're so familiar with our epistles and even with our eschatology. We know the book of Revelation and we've got ideas about what the end looks like. But somewhere along the way, we got lost and we forgot to follow Jesus and to follow his teachings in Matthew and Mark and Luke and his revelation, his signs and his, his self-fulfillment in the book of John of who he was as the great I am. You see, you can't do that without the Gospels. And following Jesus without knowing and immersing ourselves in the Gospels is like following an idea rather than following a person. It reminds me of the thousands of people that show up on the shores of Carlingford Lake in Ireland every year for Ireland's National Leprechaun Search. All of these people searching for something that doesn't actually exist. Jesus is real. He is the risen Savior of the world. And we need to learn to follow him. Not some ideas about him, but him. To have relationship with him. Over the next few months, this is really my heart as your pastor, is that we would focus our attention on the gospel of Luke. And our purpose in doing so is to learn about Jesus. To learn his ways, his words, his heart. And we're going to do that in the Gospel of Luke. And the reason I've chosen Luke at this time is because Luke is a storyteller. And, and I'm a storyteller. And, and I love story. And the Gospel of Luke is just this beautiful collection of stories about Jesus that are all shaped in such a way by the, by the author, by Luke, so that we can, we can really seriously take up his invitation to ask and seek and knock and to step into the Jesus way of life. That's the kingdom of God. Luke is, uh, you know, as you know already, is the author of the book of Acts. It's a two-part work. It involves characters and setting and plot and intro and conflict and climax and resolution. It's, it's a really good story. It's the story of Jesus. But today I just want to take a couple of minutes to introduce us to the author himself. Because without meaning to be, Luke obviously becomes a central figure in the New Testament, a close friend and minister and partner of the Apostle Paul close enough to Mark that he's able to know Mark's content and bring it into his own stories. But the thing I love about Luke is that without even meaning to, he follows Jesus in front of us and actually gives us a compelling example of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And that's what I want to talk about in these next couple of sessions that I have. But today I just want us to reflect again on Luke's introduction, this extremely formal introduction where he introduces himself really as a, a historian. Now the thing about Luke as historian is he's not a historian in a kind of geeky sort of way. I love history. I love museums. I love documentaries. But I'm a big geek and I know it. Luke is not a historian in a geeky sort of way. He's a historian in a theological sort of way. He has learned what theologians called salvation history. Okay, the fact that God is unveiling himself through the history of the world. He understands, as we would say, maybe in modern vernacular, vernacular, the big story 
of God, what God's big story is, the big picture of how God presents himself in the world. In other words, Luke pays attention to the world around him and the word within him. Luke's history isn't based on some artifact like an Indiana Jones movie. It's actually rooted into relationships. He understands that faith is layered generation upon generation. And you know, I think that's one of the most important things that we as followers of Jesus need to rediscover in our day, that faith is multi-layered and is built from generation to generation. When I was 19, I'd been a Christian for maybe 18 months, something like that. I was preaching, I was leading kids ministry, and the elders in my little assembly in Belfast decided it was time for Steve to do visitation ministry. And so one of the elders took me under his wing and he would take me out to visit all of our housebound seniors, older members of our church family who just couldn't get out to church anymore. I was dreading it. I was this young guy. I thought I was the center of the world, the center of the story. I had blonde spiky hair. I thought I was pretty cool. And off I went to visit in all these seniors' homes. You know, that was one of the most important things that I ever did as a young Christian to learn and discover that faith is something that is passed on from generation to generation, that is built upon, upon foundation, upon layer, upon layer. I still remember one of the ladies that I went to visit. She sat me down And she was so excited that I'd come. And she said, Steve, I've been praying for you for a long time. I thought she was just being sweet. You know, that's the sort of sweet thing that a nice little old Christian lady would say. But then she reached down beside her chair and she lifted up her prayer journal. And she took me back to when she started praying for me. My younger brother, Glenn, had become a Christian through the youth group in this assembly. And the first thing he asked the church to do was to pray for his older brother, Steve, that I would get saved. And this little old lady had got news of that, probably through a church newsletter or something like that. And she wrote my name down and she started to pray for me. And then she showed me when God answered that prayer and I became a Christian how she started praying that God would use me, that I would become a preacher and a Sunday school leader and that God would do great things. in my. And she showed me these prayers. And in that moment, I realized that faith is something that is layered, that's passed on from generation to generation. And as much as we all feel like we're the center of the story, we're not. And Luke reminds us of that in the Gospel of Luke, but particularly in the opening where he pays attention to the people that have gone before him, the apostles, the ones who had the word, the servants of the word who had been with Jesus. Now they pass on Christ to us and our job is to pass pass on Christ to the generation that's coming after us. You know, that day was awesome because that lady also reached into her purse and gave me 20 pounds to go and buy some chocolate. And back in those days, 20 pounds bought a lot of chocolate. But I learned so much from that little old lady who sat and prayed day after day in her chair that every generation has a job to do and that faith is passed on from generation to generation. You only get that when you're willing to to realize that you're not the center of the story. Jesus is. And that's what Luke does so well. We're going to discover in his gospel, he keeps bringing the attention back to Jesus, back to Jesus, back to Jesus. You know, when we came to faith, St. Thomas, that is, five years ago, everybody warned us against it. Steve, don't go. It's going to be a disaster. The old senior pastor, Pastor Bell and Nancy, aren't going anywhere. They're retiring into the congregation. That never goes well, I got to tell you something. It could not have gone better. 
The relationship that Rebecca and I have with Bill and Nancy is so priceless. They're our mentors. They pray for us. They care for us. They shepherd us. They have been a huge part of our journey here in St. Thomas. And why? Why has that worked? It's worked because Bill and Nancy have learned somewhere along the way in their journey. They're not the center of the story. They might have been the senior pastors, but even in that position, they're not the center of the story. Jesus is And so they've been able to move to the side to make room for what Jesus has wanted to do. Luke invites us into the story of Jesus, but he does it by reminding us right at the very start that this story that's being written, it's being written through the lives of many people, but it always comes back to Jesus. You see Luke's humility as author begin to emerge even right at the beginning in those opening verses that we read together. They seem so practical and so pragmatic. It's just like, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to gather up all the information. I'm going to do the research. But what he's saying is that I'm making room for God to do his work. And, And it's not about me. There's a humility about Luke. You know, Luke is an educated physician. He's an amazing preacher, a very talented preacher. Paul talks about him in his letters. He obviously is an outstanding writer. He has given us the bulk of the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, two incredible narratives. He mixed with the big boys. If anybody could name drop, it was Luke. We know from the text that he spent time with Mary, the mother of Jesus, to interview her and to to learn her story. And with Paul, probably with Peter, he spent time with the big names of the faith, and yet he doesn't boast about that. He's humble. He keeps moving out of the way. And that's what Luke seems to be inviting us to do in his gospel as we read it and learn about Jesus. It seems to be this invitation over and over again. Would you just move? Would you just get out of the way so that Jesus can be at the center of the story. You know, this is wedding season for me. And wedding season means standing in front of a bride and a groom and leading them through their beautiful day. One of the biggest challenges as someone who officiates as a wedding is to get out of the way so that the bride and the groom can have their moment and they can truly shine. But it's so hard because you're right there and you're front of, in front of all the people. And the biggest challenge of all is that moment whenever you have to say you can kiss the bride and the photographer jumps in to take a photo of that special moment when those lips meet together and you just do not want to be in that photograph. So I've had to teach myself the Stevie side shuffle where just at the same time as I'm pronouncing you may kiss the bride, I'm also moving quietly but quickly out of the shot so that I'm not in the picture this is what Luke is doing right at the start of his gospel. He's, he's reminding us that Jesus wants to be the center of the story. He desires to be the center of the story. But in order for that to happen, he needs followers who are willing to step to the side to move out of the way so that all glory, all praise, all honor can go to him, all focus, all attention can go to him. This is what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the world around us. Now I'm going to take up these ideas next week and I'm going to unpack them, hopefully practically give us some tips on how we might do that as we tease out these first and opening verses of the gospel according to Luke. But I want to end today with an invitation or maybe a better way to say it is I want to start our studies in the gospel of Luke with an invitation. You see, Luke's gospel is an invitation. Zechariah, the priest, is invited to worship God at the altar. And we're going to see in a couple of weeks that this is a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. An invitation has been extended. He and his wife, Elizabeth, are invited into the very redemption story of Israel as the parents of John the Baptist. And then there's Mary, this young teenage girl who's invited to become the mother of the Son of God. A rabble of young teenagers are invited to follow Jesus as rabbi, invited to ask and seek and knock the kingdom of God. There's the prodigal who comes home and who's invited to take his place again 
as the father's son. There's a tax collector called Zacchaeus who's invited to enter into the very kingdom of God. Luke's gospel is invitation after invitation after invitation. This morning, I want to give you an invitation to begin again, or maybe to begin for the first time, to become a follower of Jesus. You see, I know a lot of Christians, but I only know a handful of Jesus followers. I want to give you an invitation to become a follower of Jesus. You know, when I became a follower of Jesus, I said something that is famously known as the sinner's prayer. The problem with that prayer is people thought it was like a magic remedy. It's really not. It was just words. But what those words were, was they were really an RSVP to an invitation from Jesus to follow him. It wasn't the words as much as it was about the posture and the proclamation of the act. It was a saying yes to the invitation. I don't know about you, but my fridge is covered with invites to weddings that I didn't get to go to this year because of COVID-19. The invitations were there, but the ability to respond wasn't. We couldn't go. We just, we couldn't get to the weddings. Today, we're all being given an invitation to follow Jesus. Maybe to renew our decision to follow Jesus. Maybe the, for the first time to say, that's what I want, Steve. I don't want to go to Bible studies and have conversations about secondary issues. I want to follow the Son of God. The one who says in the Gospel of Luke that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the sort of person I want to follow. So today I just want to lead you in a prayer. And that prayer might be a way of you finding the way to, to, to just say yes to Jesus. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe following this little talk, you're going to have a conversation with your kids to say, hey, are you a follower of Jesus? I know you go to church with us. I know you go to youth group. You might even go to Christian school. But have you said yes to follow Jesus? He is giving you in this season a fresh invitation. And right now, how about we take time to RSVP? Let's pray together. Jesus, as we begin this study in the Gospel of Luke, we just want to course correct our journey. We want to say yes to follow you. We want to learn your word and your ways and your heart. We want to fall in love with you, the one who has loved us and given himself for us. And so right now, wherever we're watching this talk, Holy Spirit, would you just fall afresh on us and awaken in us that yes, yes, yes to following Jesus where our hearts come alive, where we immerse ourselves in the stories of Jesus and the sermons of Jesus and the calls of Jesus and the cross of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and the life of Jesus that we might become the Jesus people. So we say yes to him in Jesus' name. Amen. Uncharted, my soul will impart, and I'll follow your voice straight into the dark. And if from the course you intend I depart. I 
Once again, thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you had a fantastic and meaningful morning. You learned from God's word, you were inspired, and you're off to follow Jesus. Thanks again for your prayers, for your partnership and financial giving. We want to encourage you to continue to support the church so that we can stay healthy and strong to minister well during this season. Have a fantastic week. Happy Canada Day. We hope you have a great weekend celebrating with your friends and family. Stay safe, look after each other, and we look forward to seeing you soon.